So I want to talk now about Slovenian basketball and the 1960s American sitcom Green Acres. The most gifted basketball player on the planet, I think, right now currently is Slovenian-born Luka Doncic. He's only 24 years old. In fact, tomorrow, after this episode comes out, it's his 25th birthday. And he's been in the NBA for almost six years. He was the youngest starter for Real Madrid's dominant Euro club at only 16 years old. The man is truly incredible at basketball and always has been. But since joining the NBA, he can't seem to win. Listen, his numbers are incredible. So are his highlights. If you don't follow sports, just do a quick YouTube search for Luca highlights and you'll become a fan of him. He's cute. He's flashy. He's cocky. And he's got a vision of the court no one else has. He should be winning though, right? All the greats in NBA history win titles. Jordan, Kobe, Shaq, LeBron, Kareem, Russell, Wilt, Magic Bird. A great player can change an entire team. Luca's issue though, has been his temper. He's not violent. He's whiny. He can't handle it when a ref makes a bad call. If he gets pushed around or taunted, he gets off his game. He stops playing defense. He's slow up the court. He nags the ref instead of hustling after the ball. When people talk about the value of therapy, they're talking about people like Luca, someone who needs to be able to see himself, to understand that he cannot control others. He can only control what he does. And if he were to stay focused on winning instead of being right, maybe his teammates would follow that lead. Luka Doncic is Oliver Wendell Douglas from Green Acres. He's displaced. He's better than everyone. He can't understand why they can't understand that fact. He forces his worldview onto everyone else instead of letting it ride. He thinks logic will win out, even though he forgets about the interconnectivity of community. The comedy of the 19... Uh, sorry, the sitcom from the early 1960s and 70s, Green Acres... Uh, centers around Oliver and his wife, Lisa, played by Zsa Zsa Gabor, moving from New York City to this rural farm because Oliver wants to be closer to nature. But what Oliver doesn't count on is the vast chasm between wealthy urban elites and rural simplicity. His wife is the epitome of East Coast materialism, yet she fits in fine because while she has expensive tastes, she doesn't see herself as above the rest of humanity. And that's what's at the heart of Steven Spielberg's 1971 made-for-TV movie, Duel, a battle between white-collar suburbanites and blue-collar and blue-collar rural ugh, a battle between white-collar suburbanites and blue-collar rural dwellers. Suburban guilt is real, and these individualistic Americans who can afford the newest and nicest things. Uh, think they can outwit and outmuscle the natural order of working Americans. The truck in this movie is the antagonist, but it's hard not to root for it sometimes. David Mann and his bougie Plymouth pushing the envelope, trying to show middle management superiority. No, fuck you, David. Support the unions. And like I tell Luca all the time, you're great, but you need to fucking relax. Hi, Cecil. Hi, Jeffrey. All right, so now you've got to become... A blue collar worker of some okay. sort, but you're gotcha. going to be good at whatever you you will Im immediately have whatever skills it takes to do it and do it well. What okay. kind of blue collar job do you want? Oh man, um, blue collar job that I would want to do. I mean, there is something appealing about working out on the highways, mm -hmm. being outside in the elements. Although, here's the thing: the smell of asphalt, like cooking asphalt, like get those fumes just get to my head. Yeah, I don't think I could take the smell of it. So, uh, I think dishwasher. Like, there's something I, I I'm I'm soothed by repetitive, <laughs> uh -huh. mundane tasks, hot hot dishes. You know, I can just turn turn the brain off and coast. Oh, I didn't even think of dishes because I love washing dishes. I mean, as far as a chore goes, uh, you know, relative to chores, love washing dishes. Yeah, I was going to, there's something about like, I, I was going to say like long haul trucker seems sort of, you get a lot of audiobooks and podcasts to listen sure. to. Um, I think anything where I'm like, I think any type of carpentry I think would be fun. Like whether or not that's like, like not artisanal, like that doesn't. You're not feel building like Pilates in the benches? For, no, not for fully Gwyneth in the spirit like of the question. But yeah, like, uh, I don't know, like building houses and things like that. I think that would be really fun. Something about like seeing something made with your hands. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, Cecil, I once again failed to get us a guest, but I did find us a musician, a performer, a, a, an old friend, somebody who's talked to us on this show before. I found us a Chris Brown. Hi, Chris. Hi, Jeffrey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> how you doing i'm good how are you 
I'm doing well. Um, that's so funny. You're talking about the uh, the idea of seeing something with your hands. I, it would definitely be, I think it would definitely be Carpenter for me. Yeah. Because I love, I love that feeling, especially mm -hmm. when, you know, you've, when you, when we, we exist as artists in this space, well, as performing artists where, where it can get really, really strange, where we don't get to see the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you never have a connection to the kind of positive, uh, um, the fully positive dopamine uh, experience, like the long-term satisfaction of yeah. being able to observe the results of the work, you know, so ethereal and it disappears. And so you never know where you're kind of at within it, but then you make something with your hands you can touch it, you can walk back from it. And, you know, that there's something just really, really comforting about that ability. Yeah. So I do that a lot. I make things with my hands, just, you know, whatever it is. I work on the house, I tear down walls and put up new ones and stuff like that. And it helps kind of balance the brain a little bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And then the satisfaction of just looking at a thing, even if all you did was just make a bench. Uh, yeah, just something real simple or just like a block for the theater or whatever. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, real quick pause here. Uh, Chris, can I have you, uh, take about like six inches back from your microphone? Cause I'm getting a lot oh, of yeah, yeah. on that mic. Um, gotcha. just to make sure it's not uh, spiking. Yeah. That's how's this. That sounds great. This... Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. It's always easier to bring the sound up than it is to bring it back down once it caps out of course of course i don't really know what the latitudes of this mic are um because i don't i don't use it enough i've generally on other ones but uh so yeah that's good yeah. to hear yeah that one so this is good where you're at this yeah this is a good distance Perfect. yeah that's great because now i don't have to like bend over you'd be like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh well let's get into duel let's talk about oh. this uh this television movie from from young Steve Spielberg. Oh, that kid's I, I got immediately, promise. <laughs> I immediately want to call this episode, Dave. Man, we're gonna make a man out of you yet, man. <laughs> hey, man. One man of the best. Man. One of the best named characters, <laughs> just David Mann. A bit I, um, a mm -hmm. bit. Totally. Yeah. So one of we've covered we've only covered one other Spielberg for this show I believe and that was Jaws, and Jaws is obviously a, a classic of film and ho horror film both. But my my thing is with Steven Spielberg personally, this is my own personal thing. I think a lot of people do agree it's not original, but I I find Steven Spielberg's movies are about thirty percent longer than they have to be. <laughs> um, that that you know uh -huh. he, he can he can milk a premise for a while sometimes. And so I was really curious, knowing the premise of this movie, which is, how are you going to get 90 minutes out of this, Steve? What are you going to do? <laughs> and I think he does. I think he actually gets 90 minutes he, out of this movie. I think he does, too. It's interesting just to, like, speak a moment about this this film and, I don't know, iconography. The, the name Spielberg comes with so much baggage. Mm. like at all times and and it's funny this movie obviously he made it when he was 24 uh and and it often i like, gets talked about as his first feature length film but it isn't it's his first feature project but it was made for television yeah. so it was originally it was originally shot to be a 70 minute uh cut that then it ended up having advertisements in it and he had made i think to this point he'd done like eight episodes of television or something mm -hmm. previous within like a year and a half and then shot this specifically for tv and it's what sugarland express is actually his first feature film oh, okay. so this one this one this one often gets uh, uh looked at as the first feature and therefore i i feel like it gets overlooked for that yeah. reason because it, because people are like ah it's just you know, it's it's not it's not the the later films. It's TV. It's a TV, it's TV. movie. Uh -huh. It's a TV movie. It's a TV movie. It's not a it's not a cinematic film. Hey, yeah. listen, Pet Cemetery was a TV movie, and that shit is dope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe for different reasons, though. Uh -huh. But the I, movie this this was so successful that they then shot more footage to turn it into a feature, so that it would have a cinematic release. Interesting. I would love to yeah. see this in a cinema. I mean, it was really nice watching it like yeah. on a big screen TV with good. And also, I think this is a movie where 
you really want whatever your best sound is because oh, yeah. I think that the yeah. hero of this film, there's a lot of great things about this movie, but the, the hero is the sound mixing. Sound oh, mixing yeah. is unfucking believable in this movie. Yeah. And uh, oh, I don't yeah. know about yeah, you all, just... but but about halfway through, I started having that visceral reaction every time that foghorn went. Uh -huh. up. Like every time the horn, you're like, like you feel it. You're like, oh shit, what? Who's behind me? It's yeah. a giant truck. Yeah. Well, I, I know we're going to get deeper in the movie. The, this is you're, the part of the brilliance is that the first time we hear that foghorn, it's 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 in the first passing sequence in the movie, and. But it, we hear it from his position in the car where it's like a little bit behind him on the mm -hmm. road. But then the second time we hear it is when it's right next to him in that gas station. And it's fucking loud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like you don't expect it because it's already been established as something that isn't as loud as that. Yeah. So, yeah, the mixing is definitely, definitely a hero of the film mm -hmm. for sure. And Spielberg is has known for, I mean, he's he's such a he has such a great eye for framing, right? Like his framing is is excellent and and camera movement. Like he's just a master of moving a camera around a subject. And this movie, like it opens with car cam, you know, uh, POV. A, a POV of the car pulling out of the suburban LA County suburban home backing out onto the street and getting all the way on to the five to go north out to the Mojave past Baker's, whatever. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so good, man. Like I, I tracked the, the, uh, the drive mm -hmm. just to like, I, like I just, I was pausing the film and being like, okay, where is he? And where did he leave from? And where is he going? Et cetera, et cetera. And so he's in, he's in Glendale. That's where mm -hmm. it starts. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's fun, it, as he pulls out of the, the home this single family home and starts to go on his drive you could tell that he's that they're living in a neighborhood that is like butted right up next to wealth they're not wealthy but they're in that neighborhood that's right next to the gated like homes yeah. because at the end of the street he's facing someone's gated mansion oh, I gotcha. he's like one of one of those right and then he's driving along and he goes through downtown glendale and then we end up in downtown Los Angeles, which is a strange, like backward move. But then I started thinking it probably would be required at that time to get to the five to go north because he's headed to Bakersfield. So he went south to then drive north. Yeah, that's so weird because the five is yeah. right next to Glendale. So that's uh, yeah. yeah, that's so strange. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, wonder... I didn't. You're right. He does drive through downtown L.A. Yeah. Not so sure. is it a thing where maybe they were they were just like, well, we want to establish Los Angeles, so we're going to yeah. use that. Or or, did or, he... it, or was he not in Glendale? Do we think maybe he was like in in a like a south like an eastern like neighborhood? I don't know. He he drives straight through Glendale though, yeah. so it's like I think he's in Glendale. But then I was like, my mind as a storyteller, I'm like, oh, he he stopped by the office first because sure, he's a yeah. sale. He's a salesman, so he he's going, goes to the fashion district or whatever, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and goes to the office, and then he's on his way. Pick up his swatches and samples. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the most notable things to me about that opening sequence, beyond the the route and the establishment of like, oh, nice city driving, populated area, we we end up getting this this picture of this person that that drives by the letter, right? Like, oh yeah. The safest, you know, driving. He's always in the right lane. He's never in the in the wrong lane. He's, you know, and he's driving the perfect speeds. He's got. He's keeping perfect distance from everything, right? Hands and, at ten and, and the, two. Yeah. Yes, ten oh, and yes. two. The radio yeah. is giving him the weather reports and the and the traffic reports. Like, we are very comfortable in David Mann's car. Mm -hmm. The first time we actually see him. Like we kind of pull out of this, you are draw, you are the driver POV shot, and it, you see him. I was like, oh, he is very alert. Like mm -hmm. just his his driving stance is very um, correct. Mm -hmm. He's uh, yeah. The only the only uh, the only knock I'm going to give to his grade is the fact that he does not wear his seatbelt. <laughs> in this movie <laughs> well not also, until it counts <laughs> yeah not till it counts and also i noted that when he does put on his seatbelt, it is just a lap belt for the driver oh the 70s <laughs> yeah, we've come a long oh, way the 70s <laughs> <laughs> can we talk a second about the radio yes please mm -hmm. i this 
This I love because it. Because we don't we don't we, we don't see him or the car for for no. like eight nine minutes or six mm-hmm. minutes or something, but we hear this radio right, and it's got all this information coming at us. There's there's ads for dog things and grocery stuff and hemorrhoid medication. Oh my god! And like, the, like, the, yeah, hemorrhoid <laughs> commercial. But the big question is. Are you the man of the house? Exactly. Are you the leader of your house? Mm-hmm. Yes. You feel like the right. leader of your house. And what is it exactly? I, I I clocked it as it's 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 a it's like a radio prank call, right? Is that what's going on? It's like, like a radio radio's... call-in show. Right, but I feel like this exact moment, the census conversation is like their their version of like jerky boys where they've they're they like call the census bureau to have this they've set up this plot yeah, yeah. it's a bit it's a oh interesting bit. yeah I, I was more credulous than that i just thought it was just the old school when when radio used to not be so like po- polarizing talk show type of stuff right like when it really was like a lot of am dial stuff that i remember yeah. as a kid was like the most boring College yeah, right. shows, right, 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 right. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, man. I yeah, because when I went back and I listened to it again, while the phone is ringing, there's the radio announcer saying uh, something about you know, like yeah, in the Census Bureau, those you know those forms they send out to us, la da da, and and then so he sets it up for us, and then whoever their actor is, uh, is is on the line, and then the the young girl at the Census Bureau's office answers the phone, and then he, he launches into this prank call mm. about he's going to be like, we're going to set her up with this real problem about men and women and who's the head of the household stuff, which is really kind of fascinating. If it that's is what it is. It's an interesting choice. There's a um. I mean, at the you know the, when you brought up Chris, when you brought up the gated community outside of his neighborhood, or just on the edge of his neighborhood in, in Glendale. I mean, the I said in my intro, like class runs through this. Like the divide oh, of class is so prominent much. in this movie, yeah. but but we do have this other thing about what it means to be the head of your household. There's a real like his uh, his authenticity as a man is slipping away like a very Willie Loman sort of character yes. here. Um, yeah. when he calls his wife at home he mm-hmm. he kind of is apologizing for last night in a vague way of whatever <laughs> argument happened at some friend's <laughs> house and a party and right. one of his I don't know whatever happened and then he's like we should talk about it she says well we'll just start arguing and then they start arguing anyway and well and you I get feel the like sense getting... that he wants control of that house but knows he can't have it can't have it yeah but uh, yeah there's a uh... The, well, even in the in the census call, the 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 proxy for David Mann that's that that is in this census call says the words basically, you know, is like, well, I haven't been the head of the household since since uh since I I think he phrases it since I since I married that unfortunate woman twenty five <laughs> years ago. I think those are the exact words. But there's something definite about unfortunate marriage that, yes. that goes on mm-hmm. in the conversation and how embarrassed and afraid he is that the neighbors are going to find out how he filled out his census form. Like that kind of that mm. terror, that terror of not being seen. And I mean, because we're like what we're now in a post uh, uh we're in a post quiet American age with this film, right? Like we're at the end of the Vietnam War. There's like. There's all kinds of things about the American dream that are starting to fall apart for most people. And there's so many movies, like 71 is ridiculous. I don't know if you guys looked up the movies that came out that year, hmm. but like there's there's Duel, obviously, but there's, um, this is the year that we got um, Clockwork Orange. Oh, wow. We got Straw Dogs. We got um, all kinds of car movies, The Vanishing, Two lane, two lane blacktop, um, crazy Larry, dirty Mary, or uh, dirty Mary, crazy Larry, whatever the name of that. Um, there was um, um, a dirty oh. Harry. Oh yeah, yeah, came out that year. I love, I love that the vanishing came out the same year because it's essentially like an inverse of this movie, opposite. In that it's right? a movie about no action, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. it dealing with cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
There's a fascinating reality here too, because I was thinking about the vanishing and went back and looked a little bit of it for this movie. And, and uh, in the vanishing, we never look at the speedometer. You only ever see the fuel gauge in the car. Mm. Whereas in this movie, we're constantly looking at the speedometer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, it's a very interesting difference, I think, based on the fact that in The Vanishing, you've got Kowalski driving this Dodge Charger, like, you know, like a man's car. Yeah. And in this car, you've got a 1971 Plymouth Valiant. It was yes. considered like like the durable, reliable family vehicle yeah. mm -hmm. of, the, of the age, you know? Well, I, Just I was... I couldn't help but to think about product placement in this movie where I thought, <laughs> you know who gets great product placement is Peterbilt engines because yes, that yes. Peterbilt logo is on the front of that truck and that semi trailer, that thing has speed. It's got control. <laughs> it's got oomph going up and down hills and that Plymouth. Uh, there may be a reason why we're not buying Plymouths anymore. Yeah. After watching this movie. <laughs> yeah. You, you mentioned the truck, and the truck is the next thing that comes up in the film, right? Like after the six minute re of nothing, and then we get to see man finally in his car, and then and then we see the truck for the first time, and that truck, man, whew. character, mm -hmm. what Pure character, so character. I love the fact that it has the word flammable written on it twice. Yeah. <laughs> And and there's like burn marks over the back of the truck, as in this thing has caught on fire before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, there's there's a pretty to hear Spielberg talk about this movie some, which I've heard before, and he talked about how when David would or when Dennis Weaver would get in the makeup chair in the morning, they would also have out all the mops to to do the makeup for for the truck as well like they both had a makeup call basically <laughs> gotta get gotta get the start out of his trailer you know yeah and there's one of my favorite features of that truck well i mean apparently he looked at a few different trucks and and immediately chose that one because of its face yeah mm -hmm. because there were so many of the classic and we see in this movie a couple of times uh semis on the road particularly that opening sequence and they're all the the fresh new like flat faced uh, Optimus Prime trucks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, but this one has that 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 snout and that angry look. And then he he put uh, these license plates on the front of it from other states. And I always kind of wondered what that was, but he, he said I wanted it to be notches in the belt, like those are yeah. the, those are the license plates of people that he's killed. Yeah, <laughs> that's what across the country what came to my mind. As yeah. in, like, even from the, you know, knowing the premise of this movie, it's that idea of this is not a first time offense. Like for, for David Mann, it's he's being menaced. But for this trucker, it is his joy to menace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is really terrifying. In a yeah. Way. Well, I, you know, there's this thing where like, you know, Cecil's been in a van with me many, many times when we've been on tour and I drive and Symphony Sanders is usually my, my co-pilot sitting in the front seat with me. And Symphony's really fun to ride with because we just cuss out everybody on the road. And I find <laughs> not, we don't, we don't do it out loud to them. I don't generally honk. Well, the only time I really honk is extreme danger or just somebody is texting at a light extreme neglect yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and i'm not going to say i'm 100% not guilty of expressing myself to people but generally as time has gone on i kind of find this rule of just don't fuck with somebody cuz you never know when because it, when you find the person who's willing to fuck back with you yeah. that's uh you yep. it's you're no longer in the right uh, it doesn't or it doesn't matter if you're in the right um and that's what uh, that's what he's run into here. Like he does yeah. nothing wrong. David Mann does nothing wrong by getting behind this broken down old jalopy of a 18 wheeler. This is flammable and it's spitting black exhaust out of its, you know, tailpipe or whatever. And he passes it. And then the thing just gets mad, honks his yeah. horn, zooms past him and then slows down again. Oh, here's here's the question I have for both of you, because I. Uh... I feel like I know the answer to this later in the movie. I try to think of it as, as, as someone who looks at the movie for the first time. 
do we think that this truck has chosen him before that moment? Is this a is this a setup from the beginning? Like oh interesting. Is this truck did this truck like decide that he was the one and then position itself in front of him that way so that it would catch up to him? Because we we know we've, as we watch the movie that the truck is adept with the map. Like it can appear and disappear pretty much wherever it wants. Mm -hmm. Um it knows the roots. And in similarly, like parenthetically here, uh this is odd jaws. 1.0 right like oh, yeah. the, the whole movie <laughs> um but like i wondered that i'm like wow did is it even this first exchange that takes place a a premeditated act the i'm gonna drive slow enough that anyone behind me would get frustrated and kind of want to go around like it's a trap it's yeah literally a yeah it's, trap. it's yeah it's a trap i feel I like know, it is i i don't get the feeling that he's that this trucker this sort of you know uh, anonymous trucker has chosen him but it's like he's laid a trap and david mann being our stand-in for the everyman has fallen into it Mm -hmm. interesting yeah, like, yeah this is you know he this trucker knows exactly what he's laying out and just waits for the appropriate you know if we had gotten the old couple in the you know at the, at it the would have end, been them <laughs> it, it could have been them but it probably right. wouldn't have i think yeah. there right, is right. talking about this class divide like this trucker is waiting for the nice family friendly right. you know part yeah. well and probably and probably also waiting for someone that is going to be a bit of a, an opponent yeah you know what well, i mean that's, yeah let's follow that because i you know i i kept thinking about the title duel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's interesting to me about a duel is, is that it is two parties agreeing upon a fight to yeah. be either to maim or to the death yeah and what's interesting about this movie is that does david does our protagonist choose this that's a great question does he pick up the gauntlet of the duel no i feel like no i don't think he does until the end I don't think he – that was – I thought about that too, Cecil, because I remembered mm -hmm. we got to this movie by rolling killer games. We got sure. to this movie through games, 1970s, and this is 100% a game that this truck mm. is playing with him. I mean it's a game of death, life and death here, but it is – it's a game. It's it's a – it has a set of rules that it's playing by. Like you need to keep doing this. We This is how we play. And uh, he doesn't understand that he's in it until late because yeah. he's too busy trying to beat the trucker as a – like he's trying to not beat him. He's trying to uh, bring him down, right? He wants to call the cops. He wants to right. yeah, yeah. He wants to bargain his way out of it in the by picking the wrong guy at the mm. diner. Um, he wants to <laughs> yeah. use logic. He wants to just say, you know what? If I just hide, he'll go away. And those aren't the rules. Like you can't say – this guy's dragged him into a boxing ring and he's trying he's trying to bargain his way out. And the guy's like, no, 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 this is a boxing match. Get your dukes mm -hmm. up. Let's go. I wonder, I think, I think everything that you guys are mentioning right now is so key to why this basic premise could remain interesting mm -hmm. for as long as it does. Because if if there isn't a game and there aren't rules, then we'd get bored real fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just I pure think. chaos. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Which is why I think they don't address the. Uh, it's so important not to show the driver. It's so important not to. I mean, the only thing we know about him is is that it's a white male, because we can yep. see his arm and, and brief outline, and he wears boots. But uh, mm -hmm. other than that, like I think it's important not to know what the backstory is. Does yeah. he pick this person out? Mm -hmm. uh, did right. he, is he just reacting to him? Is it random? Whatever, like doesn't matter it's like it's it so is we now. can have these with so we can have these questions right yeah but i i think what an interesting point about the story too is that it's based on true events right like it's based yeah. on richard matheson's actual the, the screenwriter um his actual experience uh driving on a california highway interestingly the day that john f kennedy was assassinated yeah. was when so, the, was when this actual event happened so tempers were high that day tempers mm. were high and remained high yeah after that day that's like a 9 11 moment right and that changes the consciousness of the country mm -hmm. um but 
interesting that it did take place like this is based on true events which i imagine i don't know there's nothing in the film that says that but it makes me wonder if people at the time knew that when it came out mm, like yeah. if there was advertising that would have announced that because there's always something about watching a movie based on true events right the, the far no trick yeah of course i mean i yeah, think probably yeah. not because the only thing that was true was just that he got tailgated by a truck that was driving aggressively sure. right, at yeah. him which i feel like we've all been sure. a part of now if richard matheson yeah. had managed to get this truck to drive over a cliff's edge then, uh, then <laughs> yeah, I think we say based of off a of true event. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, he got the idea because a truck, a semi-trailer, was like aggressively tailing him on a ride. Right, right. Home. Right. This is a, uh, so we, the, our first exchange is, is, is what? We, got, we get a pass, and then we get a pass. Yes. And then we get another pass, and we get a honk. Yeah. Like that's, that's the opening. That's the prelude to our movie Just yeah, like, but, I, okay them. i don't like the way you drive so i'm gonna pass you and then you what what do you do i've given you the road what mm -hmm. what take it mm -hmm. what are you doing i'm following the rules what is happening here <laughs> right and then yeah, we get that honk yeah he's doing david is doing civility here right he's doing yeah. the rules of the road he took driver's ed to get his license he's done all of these things he's following regulation and the truck is like that's not how we play it out here you're in a different yeah. you're not in glendale pal <laughs> right <laughs> actually that brings up i like uh i i love this the idea of location one all these are shot on lo like this entire movie is filmed on location and apparently the studios mm -hmm. were like oh we can just do it with backdrop and steven spielberg was like no it has to be in a landscape and so similar to this idea of class difference, the struggle, the class struggle is this idea of, as you brought up in your intro, country mouse, city mouse, like what does the landscape tell us about this film? This film, there's highways that run all throughout America, but there is something about that desert that just brings <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly out in everybody. Let me tell you, boys, I live in the desert. <laughs> And you are exactly right. You were mentioning earlier about the idea of like, be careful behind the wheel of a car, like how, how you respond to people's behaviors. Like I live in an open carry state. I, I, I definitely get, I get upset on the road, but I, I, I pause. <laughs> I take my 10 breaths mm -hmm. every time because I'm like, ah, today I just don't want to get shot in the face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I live, in an open, I live in an open carry state it's like that's you know it's like it's a reality you have to consider it's like well that person is probably on i don't know some meth infused cocaine and mm -hmm. has a gun in their car yeah. so yeah. yeah and is real upset that you are interrupting their day with their shenanigans yeah yeah i think it is uh, is it maybe it's just because statistically there's more time spent in cars on the west coast but i feel like there is there are numbers that 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 equates it to the worst road rage in the country is like out west. It's, it's out got here to be where yeah. we are. Yeah, I gotta, yeah. I gotta think Pretty so crazy. too. Well, especially there's there's a higher tension of like driving at high speeds as well. Like highway road yeah. rage is a real thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, road rage in smaller, tighter cities is real. The frustration that come as somebody who just tried to spend thirty minutes trying to park my car in Brooklyn last night. Um, <laughs> that uh, yeah, you get into you get into that frustration, but it, it's so much more direct. It's the the feeling of being on the highway. It, it's a lot more tension in the body. Like that, you your body mm. can feel the unnatural speed at which you are moving. High um, speeds are very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So it's also the the oh, lack of uh, the lack of available help or quote eyes on the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know when the nearest gas station, the nearest anything not even a town but the nearest anything is miles apart mm -hmm. you don't get that as much on the sort of east coast and you know as you sort of move west the idea of vast expanses mm -hmm. of nothing in which there is no one around to help you mm -hmm. should right. you encounter crazy trucker dude we, mm -hmm. we get we get two really beautiful uh, uh long crossfades in this movie one right at the top of the car on the road you know, like just a full on like crossfade where where we see both time frames at the same time. So we're giving the impression of like he's getting really 
far away from really everything. Far away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then There's our a... and then our other superimposition is is the last frame of the film. Oh my God. But like gorgeous. We'll, we'll get there. That that <laughs> is so, God, so gorgeous. Yeah, we'll get there. So the pacing of this is like, you know, we have this kind of back and forth of like the truck then passes him and then slows down again and he's getting annoyed because now he, he's understanding this guy is fucking with him. So he passes the truck one more time, speeds ahead, and then finally pulls over to a gas station. It's going to be a long drive out through Death Valley or wherever we're at and to where whatever fucking meeting he has in Reno. I don't know where he's going, <laughs> yeah. but um, I, think he, I think he's I think he's headed to Bakersfield specifically. Oh, OK. Yeah, I would have thought that was a more populated drive, but I guess that was 50 years ago, so maybe it was yeah. more deserty out there. Well, he's going up the 14 up through Palmdale and Lancaster, so he doesn't okay. take the five all. But like you sure, know, like course, there's yeah. But then there's the um, I feel like he's going to meet some superior who lives in Bakersfield, who's leaving the next day on a Hawaii trip or yeah. something like that. Oh yeah, we get yeah, all yeah. that in the phone call or something. Yeah, but I mean. Uh, uh, unimportant it's just that he's got a long drive right like and so he's got yeah, to pull right. over to this gas station and a couple things at this gas station so one classic full service american gas station uh we don't have much of anymore and you know he pulls over the service man's filling up his his car you want me to check under the hood buddy looks under the hood and we have Chekhov's broken radiator pipe literally yes literally, you can't introduce a broken radiator hose in act one and not have it fire by act three yeah right yeah well we get and it's the, it's the first of two mentions right and then and then the and then we have the 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 gun goes off mm -hmm. but like i i love too the fact that we're we're, we're we also established some 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 of this uh continued uh emasculated man stuff in this scene because he asks him to fill it with ethyl and the the gas station attendant says uh basically if ethyl don't mind that's what he says ah uh, i like got this you kind of it's like this jab yeah it's this jab at this dude who's who's getting the the, the pansy premium gas yeah you know they're Which like, ooh, is, uh, Pinky's out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the that of the day. That was the thing. Like it was like the tetral ethyl of whatever octane mm -hmm. booster gas that that was so that it was the serious bougie gas is what yeah. he's buying. He's buying he's buying the bougie gas. It even has a woman's name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is just an interesting little bit of dialogue that that I'm like establishes more of that like emasculated guy. Mm hmm character well, and and also the 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 class difference here too right like the mm -hmm. the, the you know mm -hmm. the you know he's he's wearing his button-ups and his like fancy shades very nice sunglasses oh, i yeah. love his sunglasses <laughs> oh yeah um mm -hmm. he's got the bright red new plymouth car he steps inside to make this phone call and a woman crosses his path to use the laundry machines at this gas station right literally uh, literal, literal man spreading yeah, he's literally manspreading because he's got his foot blocking her path, just mounted up on the Loafers up on the fucking furniture and everything. <laughs> and <laughs> manspreading. I hadn't heard that. Oh, that's good. I like that. Manspreading. But we've also got we've also got the uh we've also got the, the view of the, the truck pulls in next to him at the other pump. The truck one keeps honking at the attendant, and the attendant's like, "I'll be with you in a second. And I love yeah. this, by the way. The way other characters respond to the truck is yeah. really interesting, yes. because the way the attendant responds to him is not out of nerves. It's just like I'm used to this job. People come by and honk because mm -hmm. they're impatient. Be with you in a second, buddy. Yeah. And the yeah. truck takes no note of him. Like there, there's yeah. no point in the scene where I feel like this truck is going to come back and kill this guy." Yeah. Well, I mean, the truck is is fairly innocuously friendly to everyone else in the movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as as we'll get into. Well, you except know, it's for like, the snake lady. Oh, poor snake yeah. lady and her yeah. babies. <laughs> yeah. <Snake Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, she was a victim by by proximity. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I, it's but yeah, also like... important. It's also important that that we understand that the truck is real. The truck yes. is not a figment yes, of right. its imagination, right. which is going to kind of come into question a little bit later. But other people have to see this truck. We have mm -hmm. to see other people seeing this truck. So it's not some crazy personification of the character's 
Yeah. In that, you know, like it's got to be an actual thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And we get this phone call too, where he calls home, the one you were talking about before, the uh, the big apology call, which I think it's interesting. Well, this is this is where there's another movie of the year that that I was that I ended up like kind of feeling it because at the same time, a very controversial film, uh, Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs came out this same year. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Straw Dogs, but Mm -mm. like it's it's brutal, man. It's it's a Dustin Hoffman, ironically plays a character named David Sumner, and he's like this mathematician that goes with his new wife out to Cornwall, out in the middle of nowhere, where she's from, and the locals are basically taunting them because one of the local pub rabble guys is used to date her, Um, and so he's trying to get a piece again, and you know, like the and they end up in this in this Dustin Hoffman's character ends up being this guy who won't stand up for it. He won't stand up against all the things that are happening. And his wife is getting more frustrated with him about that. And then the film devolves into just ultra violence, Sam Peck and Paul style, you know, but um, it's, it's a hard movie to watch because it's, it's really, there's a rape that is central to the movie. Like there's all kinds of things that are very, make it really difficult to watch, but what I found interesting is is the parallel in you know, the same year that these two movies came out together. And in this movie, we have this conversation about like the expectations that his wife has about this thing that happened the night before where Steve Henderson basically, you know, he practically raped me in front of the party. Um, and you didn't say anything about it. Like you don't, you didn't stand up. And, and then he misinterprets her with her passive aggressive comments, right? Where she says something to the effect of, uh, or, well, I think it's interesting, first off, that when he calls, she answers and he says, hi, honey, it's me. And she's immediately, she, she doesn't greet him. She says, what's wrong? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Cause he hasn't been gone. Oh, I don't know. Nothing's really wrong. No, yeah. did you get into an accident? Not yet. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then, and then it's like, and then she, it, nothing so then what happened and he's like basically i you know i just thought i should call and and it's the worst like apology ever like he he clearly doesn't want to say i'm sorry (laughs) but he feels obligated to or doesn't know how to do it but her response is um uh but well when he says what you said jeffrey about wanting to talk about it she said no i think her exact words were no uh, because if we talk about it, we'll just get into a fight, and you wouldn't want that, would you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's like, "What do you mean by that?" What? Yeah. Oh, right. oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then well, he blows up out of that. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, well, you you think I should call up Steve Henderson and challenge him to a fist fight? And she's immediately like, "No, that's not what I'm saying." But it's classic, like men and women, like not, you know. Like it's, it's, the communication is so bad in this marriage. <laughs> it's classic man basically yeah. doing a thing where like we teach men to be problem solvers rather than to actually engage with what's happening. Right. Like right. the fixers. Like I he yes. his immediate response is like, oh, so you're saying I should go kick this guy's ass or go beat this. And it's like, no, I've never asked you that. I'm asking you to confront the reality, which is you didn't conf- you don't confront anything. You, exactly. you fight or you hide, you don't confront, which right. is what he does throughout this whole movie, which is what the moral lesson of this fucking truck is trying to teach him, which is you need to learn to be direct, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're you're right. so passive and shifty. Yeah. I mean, in going- that, that, that gas station sequence, it, it would have been, how easy would it have been for him to get out of his car, walk around to this truck and be like, hey, what's up? See- yeah right then and there right yeah, yeah exactly no he he doesn't do any of that um mm-hmm. when he confronts the man at the cafe later like he immediately oh, assumes okay. who he is without yeah. asking any questions which is very green acres to me that scene it's <laughs> yeah, just a little bit of yeah a little constant, bit constant of... constant misunderstanding haha <laughs> yes. farce tv comedy sort of thing oh chuck's so, cafe <laughs> so um yeah so he's gonna get back on the road and he's feeling a little bit more peaked because he's had this argument with his wife. 
Yeah. She's back out on the road. This thing passes him again. Um, you know, after tailing him hard down these mountain roads, and he says to himself, I'm in no mood to play games. Let's go. Like he oh. can take this truck. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> He also says in this moment, with because when he he try he's gonna try to pass him again and the truck won't let him pass a couple times. He ah, oh, you're beautiful, and then uh, he also says, which I think is this is like a key thing. I don't I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He says it I twice, <laughs> yeah. and it says so much about that particular like class mm-hmm. person. Like he can't believe that anyone would like just with no cause put up a, a challenge to him. Like it goes back to the thing you're saying, Cecil, about like, oh, I follow all the rules. I play the, I do the thing. Um, and and if I'm playing by all the rules and nothing is gonna get out of place, you know, I, the world will be what I want it to be. I, it, will, it will live out with my expectations. Um, yeah. These dogs are going so, nuts, right? I know. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. yeah. Let me hold on one second. Give me a second. All right. (laughs) All right. You're like sleep. Hey, nope. hey, 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 now they're down here. Oh, okay. What's going on? What are you guys up to? Oh, there's guys, it's feeding time. All right. So they, um, when he's back out on the road, there's a moment where that, you know, because this truck isn't letting him pass. But there, there's finally a moment where the truck slows down, sticks a hand out, go on ahead. Gives him yeah, the wave, Cecil. gives yeah. him the friendly wave. Uh-huh. <laughs> Listen, if you think that, you're not being played at this point then sir that is your that is on you yes (laughs) yeah yeah for sure because he tries to go around the truck and then suddenly here's another car coming right at him that man is actively trying to kill you sir yeah yeah and we we only get two hand taunts in the movie right we get this one and then we get the one at the end Mm-hmm. I don't think it ever happens again, mm-hmm. but yeah, what a move, man. But in this particular one too is, is a total bait, right? He's baiting him into the first moment that we get where uh, it becomes very clear. Yeah. That, that he's being uh, affronted by someone that wants him dead. Mm-hmm. So we get into this, let's get to Chuck's cafe. Cause we're, we're, we're now like racing down a hill. This truck yeah. is, at the point now where the 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 truck is actually like bumping him in the yeah. you know like you know coming in bump 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 along nudging him along i was just amazed that this plymouth is struggling so hard to go to get to get to 90 while going downhill <laughs> and the right. handling on this plymouth is so poor <laughs> just everything about it was just don't buy a plymouth you guys is i think what this movie is telling you <laughs> This is a great um, moment to talk about that too. There's a little bit about the the drivers themselves because you had like Carrie Laughlin and Dan Van Sequel who were the the stunt driving team from Bullet, oh, the Steve yeah. McQueen movie, and uh, they do such a great job in this film. But Dennis Weaver actually requested to do some of his own driving, so there's a lot of times that Dennis Weaver is driving that car, but then the rest of the time it's uh, it's Dan Dan uh, Dave Van, Dan Van Sequel. Mm-hmm. but um but just those little all those little moments where they edge they edge the side of the road like the driving is pretty amazing mm-hmm. yeah in the movie so they he ends up he sees himself approaching this kind of town village he spends 
out of control. The brakes uh, are even speed. bad. Yes. High speed <laughs> stop from, from 70 to zero in the span of one picket fence. This is how I get y'all to lunch <laughs> on tour, Cecil, from That's now it. on. It's just like skirt, <laughs> skirt, skirt, right up into, into the right up into the cafe. Into some kind of Thai restaurant <laughs> outside of Cincinnati. That's what's gonna happen. Um but yeah, he crashes into this fence, gets whiplash, basically, yeah. <laughs> hurts his neck, and these two older guys, one in overalls, another just kind of in a workman shirt, standing around just staring at him. Yeah. It's incredible. I, I love it because the old guy walks up to him and is like, basically, you know, like, what happened? And checks him for the whiplash. And then when he, when he, when he finds out, he turns around and starts walking back to the other guy, really casually. Like, oh, he's fine. It's just a little whiplash. I'm like, I'm like, oh, wow. Car careens into picket fence at 90 miles an hour. Just another Wednesday out of Just another day. <laughs> It's also his, it's also like David Mann's inability when anybody else is around to admit that he's in this game. Mm -hmm. That he's like, if he had been like, and he starts to say, like, that truck is trying to kill me. And the guy's like, guys, I said that truck is trying, but he never picks that thread back up again, especially mm -hmm. when we get into the, 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 the cafe. This idea yeah. of he, he thinks, but never actually confirms that the killer is amongst them. And never resorts to the idea of admitting that something is off about society, that he has to stand up and go, who owns that truck? Mm -hmm. He never takes that moment. Or when he does, it's this half, like you said, this half-hearted farce of misunderstanding. Because he's so like, just stop fucking with me. And this guy's like, I'm just eating a ham sandwich. But mm -hmm. like all these characters that especially come in in this, in this act are have no idea of the stakes of the game that's going on because David Mann would rather just make banal conversation with all of them than say, I am, I'm not just having a Tuesday. I'm being stalked by a killer. Yeah. Well, Ch Chuck's is when we get the first uh, interior monologue, right? Like that's the very oh, first yeah, moment yeah, where we yeah, get the, like yeah. the, the, where David Mann is talking to his own head, which is, it, there's a lot of uh, references that come from Spielberg about uh, the influence of, well, a kind of visionary direction he had for the film was this kind of Hitchcockian suspense movie. Um, and and that's, that's a total moment for that, I feel, is that that big, long, single tracking handheld shot from yeah, the door yeah. to the mm -hmm. bathroom. We get our break, you know, we're all taking a breath. We're feeling a little comfortable. We're trying to assess what what's happened. Yeah. You know, and we get that 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 voiceover, that interior monologue, where he does basically say, he's like, he's like, you go through your life and you think nothing's gonna change. And then something like this happens. <laughs> I can't believe it's happening to me. I can't believe it's happening to me. This is the moment of the movie where I really turned on David. Like I was already annoyed with him, but I, yeah. uh, I, the, the opening shot is from the garage, right? The car, the garage yeah. door opening light car pulls away. And, you know, he is in a way, a gated community. Like he mm. is, this man is an Island and yeah. he cannot fathom the night before he cannot fathom like looking another man his friend in the eye and being like you need to stop being like this you're making a scene that that seems to be what happened the night before he didn't do that because he can't confront that he just lets things happen because he's a he's scared he's holding Caulfield you know what scares me is the other guy's face and he can't look these men in the eyes there's a lot of scenes of eyes uh, shot close-ups of eyes in this cafe oh my God. the way the other men look mm -hmm. at each other when they talk the way they glance at him and then look back to their subject but they look at him because he's a stranger but then they look back at what they're doing he looks at them and then looks down well he he literally has his hand i mean because he's trying to shield his face mm -hmm from the potential killer that might or might not be in this yeah cafe, but he literally is hiding his own face yeah, he, in public. he is he is by far the shadiest character in the cafe mm -hmm. there's oh no question by the 100%. time we get to that school bus that is without a doubt <laughs> yeah 
And but yeah, I, I love that that it is set up like a like a, a lineup of suspects. Yeah. And the yeah. thing is, is like we 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 really enter into, I mean, we spend a lot of time in the subjective point of view of David in this movie, but but in this cafe, we are living in his mind. Yeah. Like, and that's like a really interesting tonal shift for for the film. Yeah. Um, I I feel. I I I felt like this moment is almost the like we're we're gonna get teased out the the sort of um Agatha Christie like we've collected all these characters into this one cafe, and now mm -hmm. I will explain why each of you can and cannot be the murderer. <laughs> but it's sort of bungled because we are in this you know inside his head listening to his thought process rather than watching in a, like a scene play out. Mm -hmm. There's and this interesting... man. His logic is, I know the trucker wears boots. Exactly. That's That's surely all one of these men in boots must be the killer. Yeah. Well, then they, they all have brown boots, which is <laughs> pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. But pretty understandable. But I this is, there's something about this, too, that, that I found interesting. And I'm curious to see if you guys saw this as well. But like the the boots are all very similar. The, the, the boots that we see so aggressively kicking the tires at the Acton gas station um, are, are we get a really good view of them because we're in this nice like close up long lens close up of them. I'm not sure that David Mann got as good of a view of them as yeah. we did at the time, yeah. but I would love to know if this were intentional. Would it, yeah, I, it, it it works for me in this way? As we look at all the various boots, there are a couple of there that that look like they could definitely be candidates for it, but the one that he lands on. It's the guy so eating sandwich awful. is not the boot. Yeah, it's with, not with the, the boot. like half skin with like a little snake skin toe on it with a yeah, little yeah. So, uh -huh. so Spielberg gives us the knowledge that this isn't the guy. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we're immediately like, oh no, dude, yeah. don't do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't do it. And certainly don't do it like this by just walking. Oh my God. When he like, he does that thing where he's like, I'm going to look out the window. Now I'm going to take a few steps back and <laughs> hey, hey, stop fucking with me. And this guy's like, what? Yeah. Excuse me? <laughs> no, wrong. Like it's the, it's it, the inability to look somebody in the eye and be like, I have a problem. Is my problem with you? No. New? Yeah. No. Yeah. You? Yeah, yes. you're right. And it's funny because it's like, we know what he's been going through. We've seen it. I mean, we're, I've, we've watched him and the truck for, for 25 minutes. Now we know exactly what he's going through, but he looks fucking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He looks crazy. Yeah, he absolutely does. And that, and that's his problem is that, that, that one of the things about road rage, the reason road rage exists is because you can't see the other guy's face. Right. right. And so yeah. you get a confidence that comes from being in an armored personnel carrier, which is your car mm -hmm. or truck or what have you. And he's realizing just like how powerless that really is against other vehicles on the road when they try to communicate with you. And then when, he, when he's confronted with other human beings, he actually doesn't know what to do with them. He really mm -hmm. does not. He's so isolated. He's so internally isolated mm -hmm. and does not know how to just say, uh, excuse me, sir, is that your truck outside? I like, know. That's all you can do is stand up and be like, whose truck is that? Yeah, because <laughs> the only two ideas he has in that he has two fantasies. One, he enacts this one where he like actually slaps the sandwich out of this guy's hand and starts yeah. a yeah, fight. Right, right. Yeah. Or the other thing he thought about earlier is maybe I'll just walk up to this guy who I think it is and say, hey, sorry for all the misunderstanding. Let me buy you a beer. So yeah, he's I got know. alpha dog or beta dog. I know those aren't like real mm -hmm. things, but you know what I mean? Like he either wants <laughs> yeah, to roll right. over and show his belly or he wants to exert his dominance. He doesn't understand. You know, you could just do a little question asking and it'll all be fine. <laughs> yeah. Right. But he gets his fucking ass kicked by this guy yeah, he not does. for not <laughs> for confronting him for slapping the sandwich out of his hand yeah, which man. again goes into what you were saying earlier Cecil about the rules of the game that the truck is playing mm -hmm. and here there's a way to confront people even aggressively in public to say I don't like the way you're talking to me I don't like this 
but he like he breaks the rules he slaps the man's sandwich out of his yeah, hand which is not on the table for how we <laughs> no. can hurt someone <laughs> no mm -hmm. totally especially not. when that person doesn't uh even understand what the offense is no <laughs> yeah classic Right. And it's also interesting that he's in, you know, the gas station. He's in a, a a trucker diner, essentially. So he is out of his element. And there's mm -hmm. this feeling mm -hmm. that not only any of these men could be the trucker, but it's also that they could know, be in cahoot. You know, there's this this almost like we edge into that mm -hmm. conspiracy village territory of do these people know that this is a regular thing? Does Has this truck pulled through this? this area before and done this kind of thing right yeah and uh so we get we get back out on the road uh he's you know he's kind of he's uh worn out his welcome at this diner because even yes. the cook comes out and is like uh dude you gotta go yeah so he gets done. back he gets back out on the oh one thing is he sees the man he confronted like go out and get in a different truck altogether oh, yeah. wrong wrong you fingered the wrong guy and then before he even David even leaves, he sees the truck just drive off on its own, meaning that driver was in the cab the whole time. He yeah. he was just sitting out there. He never, never even came in. It's all projection. Uh -huh. Projection. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah there's there, there's some classic great uh suspense moves in this in that in that whole scene. I think, you know, the the leaving of the of the cafe. All of the various people that leave the cafe. The guy, the first guy that leaves the cafe, and he he kind of runs his hand along the along I, the, I the, love that. the front and of the truck. Looks like uh -huh. he's gonna go right in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So pulls around. Yeah. And, and that's mine. Nope. No, no, it's mm -hmm. not. Fake out. So now we've got a couple of things. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna push us all to accelerate through the rest of the film because <laughs> yeah. we are where we normally should be ending so uh okay right on. yeah okay Sorry, so I, no it's fine, I, fine I right. don't worry about it we'll just keep I going apologize about these guys no it's fine hey kids y'all are adorable look at those cuties they're pretty they're pretty cute nice hey sweethearts yeah. noisy yeah. little kiddos noisy kids uh they have a right to be noisy they're cute yeah so, so we get to the train crossing so he's driven on ahead he thinks he's lost his truck I love how oblivious David is at the train crossing to yeah. just like doop to do, just listen to the radio again. Like, my man, have do you remember how this truck just appears out of nowhere every fucking time? <laughs> and it yeah. does, and it starts driving him toward the train. Yeah. This is this is uh one of the scenes that was shot to expand this to a feature, by the way. Okay. Yeah, the train scene. The 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 pushing of the car. I love I love how the truck and the train talk to each other via the horns. Yeah, like there's yeah. a there's an un there's a a spoken uh just not in verbal yeah. language. There is a mm -hmm. there's an understanding between these two entities in the infrastructure of our world mm -hmm. that yeah. that yeah. that D poor David Mann is not privy to. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's that's pretty fascinating it goes back to that class thing that you're talking about like the the the, the engineers and the truck drivers they're 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 friends they've yeah. they've they're buddies they're like i'm here so am i after this train sequence i all i could think of was you know what just drive back to town call the fucking person you have a meeting with and say listen i got into a car accident which you did yeah and I got whiplash, which yep. you did, and go the fuck home. I don't know if the truck will let you, but get back to fucking L.A. You know, just get yeah. back to where you can just live your island life. Or where there's a fork in the road. Yes. And multiple <laughs> options could be taken that you have a one in three chance of escape. Yeah. Right. So he, um, it's after this, uh, it's after this train situation when he, um, I'm sorry, it was right, bef right before the train thing. I got these out of order, but it's where we find the bus, oh, right? The school school bus. bus. You know, nothing no. like a school bus full of children to up the stakes. A oh bit. my god, <laughs> this is so chaotic! Oh man, and, oh my god, I love. I, I love, also I love the character who plays the bus driver. Uh -huh. is classic, like someone with one of those faces that you would cast as the ice cream truck driver who is in fact just killing children out of the you know like he's yeah, got yeah. the friendliest <laughs> smile that you do not trust 
Yeah. And the kids, I like kids. I've, there's so many kids that I know that I love. And then, but kids in groups, school kids in groups, just mo- they're like a mob of demons. Yeah. <laughs> they're so mean. Like they're so mean to him. Well, this is, uh, this is where I wrote down green acres watching this because that it's this realization that like, like Oliver in that, in, in green acres, like everybody else is crazy to him and he's our entry point to the world but because we can see the world through his eyes we understand why he thinks everyone else is crazy why this bus driver is whatever he is but honestly bus drivers not the bus driver is living by whatever the rules of this area are you know what i mean like he's like the kids are fine stop worrying about the kids just help me push the fucking bus which is also a terrible idea. It's like, he's like, no, I'm just going to get stuck under your bus. He's like, no, you want, you'll be fine. All right, let's do it. Yeah. And he, and he, and he caves, 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 caves. Yeah. And sure enough. It's another lack of confrontation where you, yeah. he knows mm-hmm. it's wrong. And so all he has to do is say, I'm sorry, sir, that won't work. Can I do something else? I can drive back to town, get you some help. Um, what do you need? I'm not pushing your bus because it's not going to work. And I'm not using my planet <laughs> yeah. to push your school bus. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've already a reasonable speed so you can jump start it mid roll. Yeah. Well, and interestingly, like the as as ineffectual as the as the Plymouth is for pushing the school bus, it kind of stretches credulity that it would then be able to keep the semi from <laughs> pushing it into the train. <laughs> hey. Sorry. <laughs> But yeah, like it 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 doesn't the the it's very effective at stopping the semi. Yeah. At mm-hmm. the train track. Well, it's a bit of a smokescreen though. It's a bit of a smoke screen because the truck pulls in behind the bus. And my cause having never seen this film, I was like, mm. oh my God, now now our poor protagonist is going to be responsible for having a school full of ch- a school bus full of children at, you know, like because it's him, the bus, the truck. And all of a sudden, if we're going to have this like three way road rage fest. Yeah. But that does not happen. It's a bit of a like, oh, you know what? You know, cool. No, kids are fine. We're fine. My problem is with you. Yeah. And you alone. Yeah. You're, you're, you keep taking breaks from our game. You yeah. keep just giving yourself a halftime every 15 minutes. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and then also, like, well, you obviously took a halftime to help kids. Sure. I'll help them out too. That's fine. We can pause our game. All right. I'll help the kids. See you back in the ring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and then we'll we'll do this again. So yeah, this this scene where the truck sits in the tunnel, just kind of glaring oh, yeah. at the school bus and him, because you don't know what it's gonna do. You think, oh shit, are we gonna watch a bunch of kids get fucking run yeah. down? <laughs> right. And it's we get also that great. this when it's also this when the, you know. We have him saying that trucker tried to kill you. Know, did you see that truck go by? And the bus driver says, "What truck?" So again, playing with mm-hmm. this idea of mm-hmm. is the truck there? Is it a personification? But they do, in fact, acknowledge the existence of this monster truck. Yeah, yeah, and it's got that. We have that wonderful uh, Christine trope with the light, the headlights coming on. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, in the tunnel. <laughs> so let's talk about the, the snake arama. <laughs> he gets to snake around this like uh it's it's very like roadside attraction yep. slash gas station this poor Fill up your gas hang out with my coyote that i've chained to a oh a the poor kid here. <laughs> yeah touch a touch a rattlesnake i don't know yeah she's got just snakes and uh she's got a giant iguana yeah it's very exciting. tarantulas yeah yeah uh-huh and um yeah. this is finally he... but finally a phone he has gotten yes. to a phone, weird place for a phone, out in uh-huh. the pay, pay phone in the middle of the thing, which is sitting duck territory for a monster truck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this truck finally is like, it's it's done with his bullshit because he is yeah. calling the cops, which is a big no-no. That yeah. is. No-no. That Can't is. Appeal to fi- the ref. No, that's flag, 15 yards, unsportsmanlike, uh, <laughs> automatic first down. This is. He is violating the rules of this truck's game mm. by calling the cops. And that thing runs down that payphone booth with him diving at the last second. Right. Right. Dennis Weaver actually did that stunt too. Wow. Apparently. Yeah. So that's, good. Like I, I do yeah. I do love this era of filmmaking that's a little bit renegade, 
a little bit studio system. You know, we've got the money to pull things like this off, but everything was practical. Everything was stunt drivers and real yeah. things, mm -hmm. real people doing real things. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. so apparent and it really makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently. And they only, they've, they, they got one take on it, right? Oh like that God. was like, we're only going to get this one take. So it has to, it has to happen. Yeah. So um, the truck is also, uh, there's collateral damage because it's smashing all of the snake cages up too. <laughs> oh. um, Indiana in Jones. So Indiana Jones, this moment, yeah. <laughs> tarantula just perfectly placed on his leg that he's going to be like, oh no. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I didn't get the sense that we don't see any am animal death. And I get the sense, by the way, when she picks up one of her big snakes at the end that like they're kind of showing you all of the animals were fine. The collateral this... damage was to the structure. <laughs> yes. Sure. It this wasn't trying to hurt This is hurt still a PG her. film. Still yeah. PG. Yeah. I find but... it incredibly hard to believe, but okay. Yeah, <laughs> but I think it was also suggesting beyond it just being PG that it wasn't trying to hurt this woman or no. her mm -hmm. pets, you know, or her precious snakes because she's like, I've got to find my snakes, you know what I mean? Because they're getting out of the cages. So it does harm her in that way, but it's not actually going to kill anything that she loves. Um, and so in a way, the truck, Mr. Truck is sort of suggesting this is on you, David, because you called the cops. Yeah. <laughs> you're making me hit you. Yeah. You're, ma <laughs> you're making me drive through this poor woman's front yard. <laughs> David drives off from the scene, which I found really frustrating because one of the things he's dealing with is a lack of witnesses. And now you finally have yeah. another person that saw what he did. Corroborate that story. Mm. And he could be her witness, too. Yeah. Because right. she also had damage done to her property. But she's a she is a quote crazy snake lady. So yeah. again, it plays with the validity of right. once you leave the nice the nice uh, picket fence territory, you never know what you know what oddballs right. you might meet out in the the hinterlands of our society. Right. He doesn't he doesn't have like a he doesn't view them as as equals or peers or anything exactly. like that. No. I mean, he even he even spells out rye bread to the waitress. In yeah. The oh, cafe. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like she's never heard of rye, no, our, our white right. Rye, 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 rye bread. Rye bread. <laughs> oh, my God. I had forgotten that. You're right. That that yeah. I cringed when he spelled yeah. rye. Bread. Unbelievable. Yeah. You know, as to opposed to being waitress. like, there's a man somewhere in this, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure which would have sounded more unhinged, but. Right. Yeah. But, um, so he, he tries this new tactic wherein he gets, he gets out ahead of the truck and then he veers off completely uh, we'll and then and hide. hides yeah. behind their little ridge. And he's like, highway's all yours, Jack. I'm not moving for another hour. Again, you're not making after. this. You're not making this appointment. Just go home. Yeah, right. He wants that comes to... after the our showdown though with the old couple. That comes right before that, I think. Right. What? The, yeah, the yeah. Hiding? Because he's he's because yeah, yeah, this yeah. is where he knows the truck is waiting specifically for him. Because oh, he tries please. to do the like slow. Um, you know what? I'm going to go 30 miles an hour. I'm going to go 15 miles an hour. Yeah. Let him get as far ahead as possible. But yeah. that does not work. No, Why? because he yeah. he ends up getting that, that moment where he turns a corner and the truck's sitting there waiting. Oh and then he God. stops in the middle of the road. And in then the we middle have of the great, road. We have that great yes. shot of the station wagon coming and almost to running into him. Uh -huh. Again, he's the one who is now like he's now <laughs> taking his his uh place in the game, but he's the one who now looks dangerous to any outside eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also the first moment where we get a real like, okay, here's a decision to confront. Yeah. Because he he gets out of the car and he decides that he's gonna he's gonna walk over there. He's he's, he's actually gonna, gonna try him. and look at the man yeah. in the eye. Yeah, yeah. But the semi then taunts him by just like, Well, you can run after me, but you can walk toward me. All I gotta do is like just push on away. the gas. Yeah. <laughs> See yeah. you down the road. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, this this confrontation where he, you know, after this long wait, um, you know, seeing the truck up ahead and then pulling up, and then he he flags down this older couple. They're also in a Plymouth, just a 1940s model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, green Plymouth. We don't do a lot of green cars anymore, but he flags them down. And like you said, he's like, he's the one who looks crazy now. Yeah. <laughs> and the truck, like the semi backs up at them and they're like, oh, fuck no, we're out of here. And they're out. We're out of here. They are out. out. They're like, we want none of these shenanigans that, which understandably. Yeah. Like Larry, press on the gas. And he does. <laughs> and they're out. Yeah. No, right. no respite. Again, he's breaking the, the rules of the, the, the truck is set out. You can't phone a friend. No, no, no. <laughs> the truck does the truck does that great thing too, where where it it back then it backs directly up at his valiant, and we think that it's going to destroy it, and then it stops bumper to bumper with it. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. like let's go, man. Yeah. yeah, and then and then man gets back at the car, and then then we get our second taunt with the hand, which is like game's not over, friend. Yeah, <laughs> again. Like, let's go, let's go. All yeah. he has to do is just drive. All he would have to do is just follow that truck at a reasonable distance. Uh -huh. Theoretically, uh -huh. I'm yeah. assuming the truck didn't like just stop in the middle of the road indefinitely. But then that would force confrontation, personal one on one confrontation. You just have to suck up some exhaust for yeah, an however hour. long. Yeah, yeah, and however long the guy decides. Or just go home. That was or my just vote. Just go just home. Just turn around yeah, just go and home. go home. Yeah. <laughs> You're obviously not comfortable out here. You're more comfortable in Glendale. Glendale's very nice. Go hang out in Glendale. Yep. So they, um, he says, fine. He gets back in his fucking car, finally puts on a seatbelt. Truck driver waves him on. And then now we're Sun in pursuit. up. Yep. Um, he, there's a moment where he thinks he sees a cop car. Cause you kind of see like the white mm -hmm. door panels on a black car, but he pulls up next to it and it's just so-and-so's pest control. That's like broken down on the side of the road, <laughs> which, uh, which, uh, point is, uh, Spielberg spelled backwards is the name of the pest control. Oh, okay. Just a little, just a little bonus there. <laughs> but this is important because it puts him in front of the truck again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, now mm -hmm. we play the uphill downhill game. Yeah. yeah. High grade, low grade. Yeah. There's right. um. There's another beat where they're passing the train and the truck and the train honk at each other. Mm. But he's um, he's trucking it uphill, right? These 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 steep up and down mountain yeah. climbs that happen, and he's going uphill, and then there is a, the the truck is struggling to get up, like a semi trucks physics. Yeah. It's not um, a magic truck, which no. appreciate. <laughs> yeah, totally. By the way, I did have a brief moment wondering if you could outlast a truck a long haul. Like, uh, right. Like, what is the gas mileage on that truck versus your planet? A, a, mm. a semi truck will get about six and a half miles a gallon, but it also stores about 300 gallons. So you're going to get about 2,000 miles on a tank of gas okay. in one of those so, trucks. Yeah, yeah. You can't, it's, yeah you're, it's, you're definitely you can't not going to beat it. Yeah. <laughs> so he's. But he's he's gaining ground on this truck because he's going uphill, and then Chekhov's radiator hose pops. <laughs> oh my god! His his steam steam and oh my god! The, all the light I love all the seventies the, the lights oil oil radiator <laughs> uh -huh. zero empty. It's so Spielberg. It's so buttons and knobs and dials and yeah. Oh, I love it. I also love I also love his his response like because in most action movies or, or or movies of this uh, ilk you're, you're gonna get the guy that's like come on bro yeah. yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but 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 dave man is like oh, oh, oh. Just make it, please <laughs> like, just make it no and he no. does kinda he does make it to the top of the hill going 10 miles an hour <laughs> yeah oh that's what it's the momentum that finally carries him to the top and so now he can throw it into neutral and just coast back down, and um, like I don't, I don't love this plan, my friend, because yeah, that I, truck like, what is the end game here. Yeah, because that truck is going to have way more momentum than you yeah. have in neutral, and it has all of its engine power. It is also at this point in the film, this Plymouth, at this point, this Plymouth Oof. is looking rough, real rough. Hubcaps, like he's like careening into sides of mountains. Uh -huh. Oh man, like the wheels are coming off the bus here. <laughs> yeah. But he's, I, I do like this plan, which is if I can get neutral going downhill, one, it keeps my momentum going. Yeah. Two, it's going to cool the car off. Yes. Because mm -hmm. the engine has died because it overheated. But if I can get all of that airflow 
that's mm-hmm. going to do the work of what the radiator would do while I'm driving. So it's racing all the way down. He loses control of the car, smashes in, veers into the side of a wall. But it's all that coasting that allowed him to restart the car at the last second yep. and not get smashed. Pulls off, well, kind of does a, also... a high speed U turn into uh-huh. the uh, the up. Now he's like, okay, fine. Now we're like, I love this part. Where he's like, just leave the, you know. Jeffrey, I think when we pulled this movie, you're like, there's many ways to escape a truck. Yeah. And one of them is go where trucks cannot go. Can't go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I love that idea. too. This at this point in the film, too, where we've we're establishing how far off road they've gotten. Oh, we yeah. have all these road closures and like and they're 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 out there, they're deep. And then he bites his lip and he's bleeding because mm-hmm. he ran into the thing, you know, like it's 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 truly becoming life or death. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also reminds me of, you know, the idea of like where the maps end, where beyond mm-hmm. here be monsters. Mm-hmm. And in this case, totally. you have to fight a monster with a sword. You know, like it it is in this moment beyond the road closure in the true like, you know, liminal spaces of, of the countryside that you can kill somebody and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. probably no mm-hmm. witnesses. It's almost like it's a metaphor for his what? lack of confrontation that if you keep avoiding <laughs> something, eventually you will have to face it. Yes. <laughs> um, for sure. Yeah, he gets out onto this like dead end ledge and he can't go any further. There's just some barriers because, you know, protecting you from driving off a cliff, basically. And he turns his car around and says, let's play chicken. That's it. We've been waiting for this. This is the moment. Fake out chicken. Fake out chicken. Yeah. He, yeah, he actually Mm. loses the game of chicken, but wins at the game of flying off, you know, sending this truck off a cliff. Oh my God. When he pulls that briefcase out of the back, because it's the first thing when you're like, okay, once you know the game is being played, how do you win? Well, Mm. that truck is very flammable. All you have to do is not be in your car when you ran your car into that flammable truck. Mm -hmm. This is the, this or the train. The the train is the other possible deus ex machina of what could beat this truck in a game of tough. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that we got Chekhov's broken radiator hose pays off. Chekhov's flammable truck does not. No, it doesn't. No controversy. I know. Yeah. What do we make of up, that? Does it? Well, there's also the moment where, as it's going off the cliff, uh, the driver's side door is wide open. So it's like, did the driver go down with the truck? Uh, yeah. Did he? Did he not? Oh, they do we show blood know. on the cab well, that, of the truck. That's it's oil. Though it's not oh that's blood. oil yeah, that's not yeah, blood yeah. oh yeah yes it's, it's oil it, it, dripping off the steering wheel yeah and it teases out that suspense of oh. you know the truck well one okay when the truck goes down this slow motion shot of a monolith falling silently through smoke mm-hmm. the only thing I thought of was when dinosaurs ruled the world ending from Jurassic Park <laughs> <Park. laughs> it is so like Godzilla you know, watching something epic slowly and gracefully and beautifully fall to yeah. its death. Apparently, Spielberg set up seven uh, uh, positions to get that because they only had the one truck. Oh, yeah, but but the camera work on that particular angle was so incredible. That's the only one he ended up using. That's it. That's yeah. it's yeah. Uh, like sublime, absolutely yeah. sublime. Uh-huh. But it's that moment where you know David, the, the you know. David Mann is like, he's literally does a like woohoo kind of whoop. Like, yeah. I beat him. I done beat <laughs> that guy. But then the realization sets in. Have I? Have I? Yeah. Is is there a but he doesn't go to it. There's he's not gonna go investigate. No. He sits mm. on the ledge of that cliff mm-hmm. at sunset. We finally got a Steven Spielberg lens flare for yes. this moment. Mm-hmm. Yes. Just throwing pebbles off. Because yep. the question yeah. is. What did you win? Let's assume right. the truck let's let's assume the truck driver's dead. Like just take it at face value. Yep. You killed the truck driver, you won. He's not going to bother you anymore. Let's just say that that's the situation. 
what have you won? Hmm. Like you, you're one, your current situation is fucked because you're yeah. just, you got to walk 60 miles back to wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Your relationship to your wife is shit. You mm. look crazy. Like no one's going to pick you up. Even if you yeah. do get home, you missed your fucking meeting. What are you doing with your job? Like everything <laughs> yeah, right. about him is like, is the big win here? I learned a lesson. That's the question I have. Yeah. Like, did you learn anything right. from this? You it's walk away tough, with yeah. your life and your life alone. That's mm. it. And I, I think, you know, I, the, was it, go ahead. I always, I always think, uh, what if you had just not played? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like we like, like we've been talking about, like, what if don't you just pick up the didn't... gauntlet? No. no, don't pick it up. I think just... that's an option in this. I think that's an option in this movie. You know, Chris, you asked early mm -hmm. on, like, did the truck single him out? Did it? No. But I think mm -hmm. ultimately the truck picks up on his vibe, right? Like the truck yeah. mm -hmm. is doing this because he is who he is, not because mm -hmm. he's David Mann. But because mm -hmm. it knows the difference between somebody passing it on the road mm -hmm. and somebody being angry and competitive with it. Yeah. And right. having to there's, deal there's... with this. Yeah. This. All yeah. This. As, as you say that, I, I, I do. I, I look back at the movie and I'm, I think to myself, wow, I don't know that I think that there's anything particularly sadistic going on, uh -huh. you know, from the from the standpoint of the the truck driver. Or like, there's, there, they, you know, is, there, is there any commitment to, to sadistic behavior there, or, or is that just a part of of David Mann's evoking response and reaction uh -huh. in, in res, you know, to response and reaction? He's yeah. reacting in a way, so he's getting that back. Yeah. Just like you're yeah. saying. To circle um, back to the idea of the the non flammable flammable truck, I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. One that this idea that this truck is not full filled with gas, like it may say mm. flammable warning danger, but mm. in fact, it might be a bit of a false. It might be bluff on the yeah. truck's part. The other thing is because the truck doesn't explode, it means there's evidence. Mm. It doesn't explode in a fire bar, fiery ball of fire. And David Mann can go back to Burbank mm -hmm. or wherever the fuck he's from and be like, well, I just had a really tough day and no one can prove otherwise. There is evidence of this duel that still remains out. Mm -hmm. It may be far out in the desert, but it still exists and it mm -hmm. still connects him to this moment in time. He mm -hmm. can't just take his license plate off and be like, what Plymouth? I never owned a Plymouth. <laughs> there has to be a body yeah. that could be dug up later to connect him to this moment in his life. Yeah. As that truck is going off the cliff to the sounds it make to go back to our sound design and our mixing, it. like just it's, you know, the 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 moaning and the 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 screeching of the of the truck as it as it twists and mm -hmm. you almost feel you almost feel sorry for it. I know. <laughs> like kind of like you, it's there's there isn't that sense of like, like we discussed through the movie. I, I never kind of I'm never really on man's side through the film no. and I, yeah. I do end up feeling sorry for the truck at the end of this movie oddly it was like oh man that's that's such yeah. a terrible way to go yeah <laughs> i was i was rooting for that truck so i was very disappointed <laughs> by the ending there well let us rate this film um cecil i blah, 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 blah. no we'll start with the approach i always skip ahead I need to reorganize my notes so uh, I'll give this movie a rating on how approachable it is for those who are horror film averse. Like on a scale of one to 10, one being do not approach, 10 being super approachable. I would give Duel like nine out of 10 cold Swiss cheese on rye, R-Y-E sandwiches. I mean, it's <laughs> it's just, it's really tense. Like it's very thrillery tense. It's got some good sound jump scares with the train waking him up and the, back, and the horns, whatever. But it's not gory. In fact, it's very minimal blood. I think he bites his lip in the final chase, so he's got a <laughs> bloody mouth. But um, and no one but the antagonist dies. Um, and you don't even really ever you don't see him die actually. So who knows? It's just the truck. Um, I don't know. I think this is a very approachable Steven Spielberg B side. It's a really good thriller. Like if if you don't want ninety minutes of like 
super tense. Like it's speed, right? If you watch speed, you understand speed is actually gorier than this movie, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, nine out of 10. Uh, Cecil, uh, not for approachability, but for, in the horror canon, what rating would you give this movie? This movie is pretty darn good when it comes mm -hmm. to horror films because it shows just how much can be done practically and without gore. Yeah. So if you like your if you like your horror suspenseful, it, this movie is nothing but jump scares, uh, yeah. l rest and rest and loud noise, nothing like it. Yeah. That and I think I told you like it took a good thirty to forty minutes after watching this film for me to return my resting heart rate to <laughs> a normal place where I could go to sleep for the night. So that to me says it's an extremely effective horror thriller. So um. Because it, you know, you know, yeah, yeah, give it nine out of ten. Sure. Um, Peterbilt. Peterbilt engines. <laughs> um, it doesn't, Chris, is there anything you would like to last comments or a rating for this movie? It doesn't have to be quality or approachability or anything like that. Just any other. I mean, I, you have I'm, here? I'm, I'm totally in agreement with, with both of you. I, I really love this movie. And I, I, I feel like this movie gets better with multiple watching. Mm -hmm. uh, to be a film that it is uh, comes with all that baggage that I was talking about at the top. Like it's, it's not your Schindler's list Spielberg, but uh. if you, if you really sit with it and, and watch it again and again, it's crafted perfectly yeah. uh, for, for the suspense that it, that it sets out for. And, and the conflict is, is really, it's difficult to, you, you I feel like you, you're at you're at you're at a bit of a, a war with yourself because you can't find allegiances yeah. in the movie, and, and that makes it a really fun watch because you're you're always kind of you're you're off you're off your own pedestal. Yeah. I mean, I I would give it if a rating is like nine drops of ethyl, right? Like it's, <laughs> sure, it's it's well worth it. Well, let's figure out what movie we're gonna watch next. Cecil has a scare die. I have a style die. We'll roll those two dice and see what movie matches those two things. So Cecil, on your scare die, if you roll a one, our next movie scare has something to do with angels and demons. Uh, two, magic with a K. Three, a killer object. Four, zombies are scare. Five, animals are scare. Or six, wild card, whatever scare we want. What you got? That's a two. We're going to do magic with a K. All right. My favorite so, kind of magic. It is. <laughs> I like it with an X. Magics. Magics. So <laughs> we're going to match your magic role with my style role. So if I roll a one, our next movie is Asian horror. Two, it's a movie from the 1990s. If I roll a three, it has to be based on a book. Four, uh, a bottle movie, single location horror film. Uh, five, psychological horror, maybe something bloodless. Um, six, Something gloopy gloppy. So what do we have for magic? I got a six. Gloopy gloppy, something with magic. Okay. All right. So uh, we wrote down a few ideas that we had, and we're going to check with our uh, folks over on um, our followers on Letterboxd because they'll have ideas as well, too. And then since we have Chris here, uh, Chris, if you have other ideas for a horror movie that is real gloopy gloppy and also <laughs> has to do with dark magic, uh, magics of mm. some sort. So let's okay. start with Cecil, the ones we wrote down. What do we have here? Let's see. We've got Pan's Labyrinth, mm -hmm. which is it's a, a bit of a, it's a, um, it's a, many things. This is truly like one of the best Guillermo del Toro films uh, out there. D definitely some gloopy gloppy fairies or yes. fawns or <laughs> whatever you want to call them. And quite a lot of, um, you know, uh, active gore in the main plot. Uh -huh. We also have the witches of Eastwick, which mm -hmm. although not an overall gloopy gloppy film, listen, some things happen with cherry pits that <laughs> probably <laughs> cannot yep. be unseen. Yep. And then honestly, evil dead. Yeah. Dark magic. You have a dark tome Necronomicon. You also have all the gloop and glop and hoses of blood you could ever possibly want. E Evil Dead and Evil Dead 2 definitely fit that brief so well of magic yeah. and gloopy gloppy. Let's see what our uh let's see what folks over on Letterboxd said. Fifth Hammerer brings us Matriarch from 2022. 
Afflicted with a mysterious disease after surviving an overdose, a woman returns to her childhood home to confront her personal demons, but instead discovers truth about her mother. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Mommy. Um, they also, Fifth Hammer also gives us The Devil's Reign from 1975. A satanic cult leader is burned alive by the local church and vows to come, down, come back and hunt down every descendant of the congregation. I've never seen this one. It's on high on my list of we should watch this for the show, though. The Devil's Reign. Boy, if you tell me a movie called The Devil's Reign made in 1975 is gloopy gloppy, I would believe you. I'll believe you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the gloopy go gloppy decade. It is. Yeah, it totally sure. is. Um, uh, see, yeah. Oh, yeah. Evil Dead Rise 2023. This came from Leisha Olivier. I um, love it. It's like Evil Dead, but in the Hollywood Tower of Terror. Yep. Uh, Ganymede's Cup, Phantasm. Is this a gloopy gloppy? I don't know. It I is, very, it is gloopy gloppy. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's been a minute since I've seen Phantasm. The what those balls, those flying silver balls yeah, okay. do to I, people is I, real I feel gloopy. You. I feel <laughs> it's pretty, you. It's pretty gloopy. Yeah. Weaponized Toaster gives us uh, Slacks 2020 possessed mm. pair of jeans. Uh, terrorizing workers <laughs> at a trending clothing store. Uh, Altered States, 1980. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's some gloopy glop there. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's magic if you count Altered States brought on by psychoactive drugs, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that weaponized toaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, let's see. Rezzy gives us Warlock, which okay. is one of my sort of uh, 80s favorites um some great practical effects uh it's definitely pretty pretty gloopy gloppy that one mm -hmm. and it's definitely very <laughs> high magic with a k vibes yeah city of the living dead from brave crab 1980 gloopy gloppy um is that magic i haven't seen city of the living dead um it sounds I, I gloopy. It's, it's another necronomicon -esque, okay if i gotcha. remember correctly um, Joshua Todd gives us When Evil Lurks, a movie I just saw from 2023. Ooh. Um, yeah, there's there's definitely some magic in the tools, like, there's a fine line between, yeah, it's uh, magic in the way that, like, we saw Terrified a few weeks ago for the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, it's the same director, kind of uses some of the same paranormally magic. It's sort of like a weird combination between classic Catholic exorcism and science fair okay so um <laughs> very gloopy gloppy don pepperoni great name gives us pumpkin head 1988 yes oh i think this this is that's this a, is a classic good call. this is mm -hmm. a good call like the sheen on that monster absolutely <laughs> yeah volatin spider gives us fear street 2021 definitely it's got some got some gore and blood in there um yeah, it is magic because that that series is dealing yeah. with witchies, witchy, it's witch sort of Salem Salem witch yeah. trials esque. Ruby sixteen wallpaper gives us in my mother's skin twenty twenty three a young girl befriends a fairy who turns people into cannibals. What I mean, who hasn't? Whoa! <laughs> that sounds uh, like every college campus I've ever been on. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Cecil. Cecil, what else do we have on this list while I look up that last movie? We've got Ray Ray Baxter recommends, uh, whether it's, you know, a serious recommendation or not, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Magic definitely has some magic with a K. Um, There's some gloop and glop there. Yeah, definitely. Kind of very magic -y. It's certainly very Sam Raimi. Uh -huh. uh, itsy, the itsy bitsy, Clive Barker uh, says, take your pick, Hellraiser, Candyman, Pumpkinhead. Uh, so again, for Pumpkinhead and Mage Sparrowhawk brings us TV show Yellow Jackets, which I've only seen like a few episodes of, but it uh -huh. definitely seems it gets uh, pretty gorelicious. Uh huh. <laughs> There's a I haven't watched past the first season, so but it's, is it magic? Is it, there magic? It's in alluding there? to something called a the ritual. Magic yeah, ritualistic. But I I didn't. Yeah, but it may go, it may go that direction, but um. So I'm going to, well, I'm going to ask you, Chris, like, mm. are there ones on this list that you're like, oh, that's appealing and interesting? Or uh, are, is there something we're missing that us and the letterbox folks did not I think of? Magic I feel like, I, I, I feel like that list is, is, is pretty comprehensive, honestly, uh -huh. but, but the, the two pictures that keep 
resonating with me out of it are the devil's reign and pumpkin head those are the oh, two interesting yeah those are the two that were kind of like just kind of lingering for me devil's reign I, and pumpkin head those are both really good um Evil Dead stands out to me, of course. Evil Dead's just a classic. Because we haven't have covered done the that. Evil Deads on this show, Jeffrey. We have, it's been we so have long. Not. We, have we not. did it kind of back in the beginning, in the in the the embryonic days of this podcast. Yeah, I yeah. I feel I feel like you did early on, right? Yeah. We have sure. not. We just we never did. We Cecil uh, and I talked about Evil Dead Two. Yeah. Uh-huh. For a Welcome to Night Vale thing before we even started this podcast, so but not we did not f- not for this show, and yeah. we covered mm-hmm. Army of Darkness on this That's podcast. That's it. That's it. And also you guys covered um um whatever the the Sam Raimi drag me to hell was, right? Like oh, you yeah, guys did that sure. one. So that's why I'm thinking that you did Evil Dead. You haven't done Evil Dead. No, oh, we've man. not. But but um, I gotta say but Pumpkinhead and Pumpkin Devil's Head Rain. sounds really appealing. <laughs> yeah. Like here's the that's thing with Devil's Rain. I think if Devil's Rain looks really interesting to me, but I think it definitely falls more into the like, I don't know, let's torture witches <laughs> kind of uh-huh. era of filmmaking. Versus there's something about Pumpkinhead that is like creature feature special effects. Hmm. That sounds real pretty. Sounds pretty dope. Yeah. It is and magic. to be honest with you, like, yeah. one of the reasons why I, like when, when you say gloopy gloppy, I just immediately like monster faces. Like you, yeah. you, you need, you need to go with something yeah. that has those great special some, effects. Some shiny latex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm down. I would love to watch Pumpkinhead. I've never Absolutely. seen this fucking thing. Uh, it's '80s creature feature, gloopy gloppy. That sounds great. Uh, Perfect. I say, let's do it. Thank you. By the way, one of my new favorite name on of our users on Letterbox, Don Pepperoni, um, for that <laughs> suggestion. So let's do Pumpkinhead. Well, that was easy. Thanks, thanks all for listening. Thanks Cecil for talking with me, and thank you, Chris Brown for joining us once again. Yeah, thank you guys. Chris, uh, where can people find you and your work and your lovely doggies in this world? (laughs) I'm sure that there will be moments where you hear the dogs in Uh this podcast. Um, Yes. You know, our Uh, our listeners hate dogs. They notoriously uh, despise Will not tolerate. (laughs) Yeah. Usually I have a handler here for them, but uh, (laughs) she's currently visiting her family back home. So it's all me. Um, Uh. I'm I'm on I I don't do many social medias. I like I just got the I just got the Insta. That's the only one I do. And uh I'm at uh Ginza Samba on Instagram. So that's where you can find me there. Um I got a couple of films that are in in uh post production right now. Yeah. Uh that'll be coming out next year. And then I think the last time I was here I was it was about a year ago, maybe. And uh, I was talking about a feature that I had done that was about to to release um, called Darkest of Lies. And it is now, uh, it has been released uh, for a little while. It's out on uh, Tubi. And uh, I believe you can find it on Amazon as well and possibly Hulu. I can't remember. So there's all that. If you're in Vegas, you can come see me at, at or at least come see some of the work that I do. If you come see Piff the Magic Dragon, I still do all of his uh, his magic facilitation. Um, and then uh, I'm currently working on a um, a local uh, production of um, uh, the Lifespan of a Fact by uh, oh, John Degata and Jim Fingal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're we're putting that play up. Fascinating so, book yeah. and aggravating book at the exact yes. same time. It's okay. in all of its house of leavesness. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It's, yes. It's, it, it, but yeah, uh, you know, those are those are the things and the places and and yeah, I'm always doing something. Excellent. Well, if y'all have thoughts on duel or ideas for other movies that would have been good magic meets gloopy gloppy, let us know on Instagram at random horror nine or over on our Patreon, where we have public discussion threads for each and every episode, and you do not need to be a paying member on Patreon to participate in those. So watch Pumpkinhead 1988 with us this week, and come on back next Tuesday for a new episode. Have a restful night with no one crashing their diesel into your snake cages or nothing. Boo.